All right, good morning, everyone. So glad to have you with us. Um, my name is Kevin Light. I'm on the team at Leading with Honor, and this um, today's webinar is co-hosted by DNA Behavior and Leading with Honor. And for one specific topic, uh, we have Hugh Massey and Lee Ellis with us today. The topic is, again, how to adapt your people culture in changing times, an interactive webinar with Lee and Hugh. So again, so glad to have you with us. I think others are entering the room now. So we'll continue to let other people enter for a couple of minutes. But first of all, for those of you who are new to DNA behavior and leading with honor, um, I wanted to um, mention our, our guest today, uh, Lee Ellis. He's a nationally recognized leadership coach, award-winning author, certified speaking professional and colonel uh, from the U.S. Air Force and a former Vietnam POW. Uh, Hugh Massey is a CEO, Global Performance Accelerator, Behavioral Insights Pioneer, Entrepreneur, Keynote Speaker, Mentor, and Board Member. He is CEO, CEO of DNA Behavior. Uh, they both gentlemen have been working together for several years and they have uh, just released a new book, Leadership Behavior DNA, that was released in January. And so many of the principles and what they'll be talking about today have been taken from their years of experience, as well as this brand new book that was released. So Lee and Hugh, so glad to have you here with us this morning and glad that you're able to spend a few minutes with us talking about this specific topic that's very timely and very important that we think for how people um, manage others and manage differences in their culture. Great to be with you, Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to remind those who are attending also that we have two features for you during this webinar, and please, we encourage participation. So number one, we have poll questions that will come up uh, during the webinar. And so when a poll question comes up, please cast your anonymous vote and we'll just uh, tally some results just to see how you're doing on your end. Uh, with how you're leading. And number two, we have a Q and there's a Q&A button in your bar at the bottom of the Zoom webinar um, window. And if you will, if you have a question specifically for Lee and or Hugh during the webinar, please submit your question at any time. And we will uh, spend some time at the very end tallying up uh, any questions that you may have. So with that, gentlemen, let's get started with the first question. So we're talking about leadership balance. And so Lee, we'll, we'll start with you. So what does leadership balance mean from a human behavioral perspective? And just go a little bit deeper into that idea of leadership balance as it relates to what we're dealing with right now, specifically uh, related to people culture. Well, you know, Hugh and I have been working in this, this area of natural behavior uh, for more than 20 years now. And uh, over the time, we have developed a, a world-class assessment called DNA behavior, leadership behavior, DNA. It has eight factors. Uh, those factors are so important for understanding individuals and they really uh, show how people are similar, how they're different, and it's very powerful. Sometimes though in our discussions, we simplify it down to two things and that's relationship and results because that encompasses several of those factors and it makes it a quick way for people to kind of connect with human behavior in the area of leadership and team building and that sort of thing. So today we'll do that to kind of simplify it down to results and relationships. We say that leaders have to do several things, but first of all is demonstrate good character and be reliable and trustworthy. Because if you're not trustworthy, if you're not consistently showing good character, people don't want to follow you because they don't trust you. So that's always a battle to guard your character. But then above that, you have to accomplish the mission and you have to take care of the people. And more and more as the history evolves, the people culture, having a culture where people feel valued and important, what we've learned is the more they feel valued and important, the more they're going to give their heart and energy and spirit to be successful and to perform better. So leaders need to be able to not only accomplish the mission and set the strategy and solve the problems and get results, but they also need to attract the people, connect with the people, and build those relationships where people feel valued and important. So I think, Kevin, you had some slides. Were you going to show those now? Yes, the, sir. Uh, sure will. Okay, show that uh, the one of the pyramid. And just uh, I was just talking about the character at the bottom and then the results and relationship just above. And then I'll talk for a little bit and let Hugh take over and, uh, and take it on down. So this is our uh, most fundamental leadership model because it has character, integrity at the bottom, being authentic, values-driven, and so on. The next level up, though, is this 
mission and people, results and relationship perspective. And so it is so essential that leaders do both. There's just one problem. We're not born that way. Our natural behavior is tilted generally, if you'll show that next one, towards more towards results or more toward relationship. 40%, as we'll see, are tilted toward results and 40% toward relationship. But you have to do both. And so that's where uh, it's so important uh, for you as a leader to understand yourself and to understand your people. And so I'll turn it over to Hugh and let him uh, kind of reflect on this and comment about his experience over the years in these two areas uh, of natural behavior from a leadership and team building perspective. Yeah, thank you, Lee. I, I think this is a, a very important time that we're in right now to be talking about this because in the changing times we're in with the coronavirus or COVID-19, everybody being uh, forced to go and work at home by the conditions we have, uh, businesses, some businesses are closed up, other businesses are uh, severely restricted in, in how they can operate. Uh, it's putting the leadership of every business, doesn't matter what size it is, under uh, great pressure, probably pressure that they've never seen before. And there might be even pressure coming up yet in the next few months. Uh, I hope not, but the greater pressure than, than any of us have ever seen in our lifetimes. And so what happens is when people are under pressure and what we're talking about with the natural behavior is that your natural instincts or your, what we call your natural DNA behavior is more likely to come out stronger. Uh, and that hard wiring is absolutely going to reveal itself. And, you know, without any conscious thinking, leaders are going to be acting a certain way. And, you know, you can see here with the graph that, that Lee's put up in, in terms of uh, results orientated and relationship orientated, you know, there, there, there's a tilt. And many leaders have a, a, a results drive uh, uh, tilt, not every, every leader. But, you know, if that is the way you are under the, in these times, you're probably not going to be thinking about the people as much. You're going to be thinking about, well, who can I fire to save costs? Um, you know, what are we going to do to, you know, restructure the business? And I know just from uh, what I'm seeing out there, working with lots of entrepreneur leaders, that, that people are, uh, you know, cutting off their arms and legs as far as their business is concerned very quickly. Um, sometimes that might be necessity, but other times it could be just out of panic uh, and emotions taking over and that, okay, bad times are coming, I've got to fire people and uh, tighten up. And that, that can be very damaging to the culture. It could also be very damaging to the future of the business because key people could leave and uh, you not be able to, uh, to grow or move out uh, when, and, 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 get, and get things executed when you actually really need to. So, so this is where, you know, managing your leadership before your ba leadership balance in these changing times is so important. And, and also because we're working more remotely right now, you can't see your employees every day or touch them, uh, shake their hands, give them a, a, a cuddle. This whole uh, culture gets a lot harder to, to manage and people just revert back to what they know. And so, you know, if you're a results orientated person, you're probably going to lean that way more naturally without thinking. And if you're a relationship orientated person, you're going to go the other way, maybe too much. Um, you know, and I think as Lee is saying, there, there, you know, there is always a balance there that uh, has, to be, has to be managed the whole time. And where each of us start from is very important in these times. And, you know, I know that I'm a very results orientated person, less sensitive to the relationships naturally. But I've realized that in these difficult times, I have to show a lot more compassion, communicate a lot more than I would otherwise. And I've been doing, you know, making uh, extreme efforts, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, you know, every day to, to reach out to three or four people that I haven't connected with in recent times, whether it is an employee or a friend or another business leader somewhere to, to engage them, to make sure, actually just make sure they're okay. I think this is, this is, you know, all part of the, the leadership balance. Well put, Hugh. I love the, uh, the way you explained it because one of the things that I think about 
you know, I, I'm part of the 20% that has some of both. 40% are results oriented, 40% relationship oriented. I'm part of the 20%. But it's so easy um, when I'm problem solving. Uh, Kevin, if you'll back up to that slide, I had one more comment on it. You see down at the bottom, it says neural seesaw. That's the uh, psycho psychiatrist, psychologist uh, um, terminology for the new scans they've done of the brain. And they talk about the neural seesaw, that we're born with have two networks in our brain, and one of them is the task-focused network, which we would call results-oriented, and the other one is the social network, which we would call the relationship-oriented. They're kind of driving that. And so what the, they've shown is that when you're focused on tasks and getting results and problem solving, that other part of your brain that relates to being open to people and thinking about people, it just kind of shuts down. And so I find myself wanting to solve problems and not thinking about people. So I have to be intentional. And you were kind of indicating that in the terminology you used to, that you had been intentional about saying, I need to connect with people. And so you, I've actually done that too. I have a list. I come up with a, a list every day of, okay, who are the people I need to reach out to and just let them know I'm thinking about them, that they're important to me. Because it is a, a difficult time and you never know how other people are responding. And that's what we want leaders to be thinking about today as we talk about teamwork and leading people is to one, to know yourself and to know what my tendency is. Uh, and then to think about my people and where they are and, uh, how can I connect with them and let them know that they're valuable and important to us? And there, there's so many advantages and angles to that that we'll talk about today as we go through. But this neural seesaw, it's interesting. We've been calling it, a, we've been using a seesaw for many, many years. And then last year, uh, when I got introduced and connected with uh, uh, Dr. Richard Boyatzis, who is one of the most famous uh, kind of neuroscientists around human behavior and leadership behavior in the country, and uh, I heard him talking about it, and then I started reading about it, this neural seesaw, they call it. And so it's interesting how this is our experience and their research have come together. Wonderful. Well, and then Lee, you did allude to the idea of this 40-40-20 mm -hmm. split and how people will naturally gravitate towards one or the other. And so we wanted to briefly show this slide as well. And some 20% have a tendency for both. Yes, and under pressure, under pressure, they're going to go toward results. Yeah, and I think that that's right. And I think what you know what I was saying in relation to myself, and I'm I'm one of those that you would consider in the forty percent green there for results. And I'm aware of that, you know. And uh, Lee's made me aware of that, and everybody else has made me aware of that, um, you know, from from pretty early in life where where it got ingrained. Um, but my consciousness of that, but also knowing what my values are and what is important to be successful as a leader has made me more aware to uh, spend some more time in the blue and, and hopefully stick around the, uh, the light brown there for a lot of the time, but it's that juggling act. But, but the important thing is for all of us is to know what your starting point is and then to be adapt, to, then to adapt. And you know, if you, you know, many of us who are in the green like to think that we're relational. But the reality is we may not always be to the extent that we think we are. And, and this, is, this is constant work uh, to do, you know, and, you know, the, if you're in the, in the blue, it's also work to get yourself in the green sometimes because you've got to harden up and toughen up a little bit and, and, and get those results, holding people accountable and making sure things get done uh, is also e e equally important to being an emotionally intelligent leader. So the successful leader that, that does really well can stay in the uh, the light brown area for, for a lot of the time, and uh, you know duck and weave between green and blue as they need to 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 achieve results. Yeah, I was working uh, back in December with a retired four-star general. He's uh, CEO of a foundation and uh, a well-known foundation, and we were actually going through this, and we had a pause, and he kind of reinforced what we were saying about being able to, the need to adapt. And, he's, and he was actually much more, by nature, more people oriented than I thought he would be, more relationship oriented. He was very relationship oriented, but he's also very tough. And I thought, well, he's a 
very successful fighter pilot general, he's probably more results oriented, but he's learned to do the other. Well, it was just the other way around. He's more relational and he had learned to do top, be top. And he said, I learned the higher up I went, the more I had to focus on doing what I'm not good at, talking about this leadership of results relationship. Because what came easy was being a nice guy. What was sometimes hard was being a tough guy. But he had obviously done it very well. And he had this probably the most uh, astounding reputation than anyone I've ever known, uh, general in the Air Force or colonel or whatever, leader, because he was so aware of whether of the, the need to be relational, but the need also to be uh, tough when you need to be tough, to set boundaries and hold people accountable and do it in a respectful way. And he had done that for so long that when I went to his retirement ceremony a couple of years ago, it lasted two hours and 38 minutes because one person after another was telling about what a wonderful person he was and even the ones he'd been tough with. So that's the kind of leader we want to be is uh, somebody who's capable of showing great compassion and empathy for others and being uh, interested in their future and their welfare, but also helping them stay in line and, and helping them achieve their own goals. You know, I think this is probably, uh, Kevin, a great segue to, uh, to the next part, you know, in terms of, you know, connecting with the heart. And just to sort of segue this, you know, I've had the very interesting experience of being on the board of a, lot, of, of a large not-for-profit, not global not-for-profit um, called Entrepreneurs Organization recently. You know, and we've had to make very big decisions about, uh, you know, the membership, the future, consider what's going to happen coming down the pipe. And, you know, you've got lots of people reacting emotionally, which is, which is normal, including some hard nut leaders. And, you know, before we make big decisions about what our dues are going to be in the future, how we're going to deliver the service, you know, one of the important things is, is to look at the data. And, and that's what a results driven person would do. But then what's the solution? It's got to end up somewhere uh, more, more along the compassionate line. And I think at the end of the day, you know, what I've really seen out of it is for all of us as leaders is, We've got to be able to manage our own emotions, the emotions of others, get enough data to make the right decision. But hopefully that right decision involves compassion, not only for the employees, but also for the customer or the member that's involved with your business. And that's where we're seeing now, you know, some very interesting scenarios where I could see insurance companies are handing back refunds uh, because they know people aren't driving a car in, you know, for the next few months and won't have an accident or less likely to have an accident. But then you see some other businesses being extremely tough and, and you know, you wonder how they're going to survive going down uh, in the future and, and they're being tough with their customer and their employees. And I think that's a signal in this environment that that may not work, that may not be accepted or well perceived in the community. And I'll be interested to see how their brands go. I think, you know, again, this juggling act is not just what happens internally with the employee. It does reflect out in how the customer is treated and then ultimately how the business is going to uh, be perceived and operate in the marketplace uh, and, and, and the broader community. And I think it's keeping that balance all the way through. And, and this really plays into our point of, you know, digging in there and uh, being compassionate uh, it ha has got to come out, leading from the heart. Yeah. You know, um, I did a webinar for a hundred and something people from a military organization uh, week before last. And we did polling questions. It was actually a webinar, so we could do polling questions. And uh, one of the questions we asked was a multiple choice. There are about five choices about what's been the most difficult aspect of uh, being working remotely and not going to the office and being able to hang out with everybody and work in the office every day. I didn't say hang out with everybody, but just working in the office. What's been the most difficult of uh, shelter in place? And of the 110 or so people in there, over 40% chose one item, and it stood out way beyond the others. And the response, the rest of them were kind of split. The other 60% was split between the other four. And that one was, I miss the camaraderie of being with my teammates. And so that tells me a lot about the responsibility of leaders to somehow come up, use this technology, that we have to connect with people to keep that camaraderie going because that camaraderie gives them a sense of belonging. It gives them a sense of uh, being connected that uh, I may be in this location over here and you're in that location over there, but we're connected. 
we have a common mission, we have share other things in common. And, and secondly to that, camaraderie, camaraderie also has this implication of we care for each other. And that's a very powerful thing. You know, in my POW experience, isolation was about the worst thing you could have happen to you. And our enemy knew that. So they always tried to isolate us as much as possible so that we couldn't communicate, we couldn't stay connected, we couldn't have camaraderie. So that was our battle, almost a daily battle, was to stay connected. So I have some uh, experience with this and I know how important it is to stay connected. And that drives me to actually pick up the phone and call somebody or text somebody or to reach out to someone. And with that, to let them know that I care. And thinking about how to do that uh, is something I have to be intentional about also because I can't just be business-like, you know. I have to be connecting and connecting with the heart, as you were saying. Yeah, and I think in these changing times, it's this is all the more uh, the time to know your people, Lee. Mm -hmm. and you know, it's something that I've been doing in some webinars and this, you know, in, in dealing with these troubled times and, and dealing with isolation. You know, I did a webinar last week and, you know, we're all feeling isolated. Um, even though I joke a little bit, this is an introvert's paradise because I'm an introvert and I've been able to stay at home for 30 days uh, other than go outside for a bit of exercise. But, but, but extroverted people would be feeling this very, very much because they do need that social connection, that interaction, feeling people's enthusiasms. And, you know, the online technologies help to some degree, but they don't completely solve that problem. But mm -hmm. that's all the more reason that the leaders have got to absolutely be engaging, particularly with the, uh, the extroverted people more so. But of course, you don't want your introverted team members to be getting lost out there and just uh, roaming around and you don't know where they are. So it, it, at the end of the day, everybody's got to be engaged with uh, and, 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 and frankly, even more in, the, in these change, in changing times. And, you know, you know, I think this is important to, to, to protecting the people culture because it's easy in tough times just to forget it and uh, we'll just keep managing numbers and uh, not realise that people want to be communicated with, which is so foundational to a strong people culture. Yeah, you know, and I was thinking about this this morning, uh, about this webinar and a blog I'm gonna write tomorrow for the month of May, I write one every month. And I was thinking about how extroverts have an issue too, because extroverts like to connect, but they also like to talk a lot about themselves and what's going on with them, rather than stopping to think, okay, I need to be drawing out this other person. Where are they? What are they experiencing? What's their challenge right now? And how can I affirm them to help them to feel good rather than how can I, how can you make me feel good? Which extroverts like approval very much. They have a real high need for approval. And if you manage them, you need to know that. Uh, they need more affirmation than others. I came up with, uh, I woke up this morning, uh, I've been reading a book, uh, it's from the 70s, okay? It's a little book, I won't go into it, but it was talking about the generation that was coming along in the 60s, late 60s and early 70s and how they're not so dis they're not so connected with themselves internally and how could we do that? And it was talking about staying, being able to connect with them. And I thought, well, that's what we're talking about today. We're the same stuff. And so this thing came to me when I woke up this morning. Care, C-A-R-E, connect, affirm, regard, hold it, communicate, esteem for that person, and encourage, C-A-R-E. So for a highly results-oriented person or someone who acts that way sometimes, that's going to help me to think through, okay, how can I handle this situation and get away from my nature to say, this is what's wrong and this is what needs to be fixed. So that's kind of my nature. It's a little bit, you've got to bring the care act into your business, don't you? Yeah. If you think about it. I mean, but that's when, you know, as you break out the, the word care mm -hmm. and the government's brought the care, the care act in with lots of money coming behind it. Uh, goodness knows what that actually means for us all yeah. uh, later on. But uh, that's what you've got to be doing in your own business. How, how does your business care about its people internally, the, you know, the employees, the contractors, everybody that's involved in making it work, but also the customers and, and, and the other stakeholders in the community uh, is very important. And I think what Lee, we're leading up to here is, you know, it, one of the ways that a, that, a, that a leader can, you know, lead from the heart, if you want to call it that, 
and, and, and get to the truth is to ask people more about their about their purpose and what makes them tick mm -hmm. and uh you know and, and their values and have them more you know what gives them meaning um you know i've talked about identity you know I, i've been to, saying to people well how do you want to show up when all of this is finished um because that's going to be very important that's a, a you know a way to work a way to work forward right mm -hmm. sort of compartmentalize this and build a bit of resilience and and and, and realize you know yeah this is not a great time but uh, there, there's going to be sunshine there. And how do you want to look when there's sunshine? <clears throat> yeah, I think when we have these kinds of times when we stop to reflect a little bit, and we take a look at ourselves, uh, and who am I, and what do I stand for, and what I want to be, it's a good time. I know the POW camp was a great time for me. You know, I thought I knew myself pretty well, and I did in many areas, but there were areas where I really wasn't probably living uh, in as close alignment to my values and to my um, the person I wanted to be as I should have been. And so that was a time of course correction for me. I made the best of that time. And I think all the POWs, I would say more than 90% of them would tell you they did the same. They came out a better man because they had time to reflect on who they were and compare the gap to where they wanted to be and to work on that. So I think right now is a good time and especially as leaders for us to reflect on what kind of leader am I? Am I doing the kind of job I, I would expect to be a good leader and where's the gap for me and how can I adjust that gap coming out of this? Uh, this that might be something good to talk about uh, before we close out today is uh, how do we adapt and get ready for the, the takeoff that's going to come uh, down the road here a little bit? Kevin, did you have another question? Um, you, you did mention, Lee, you did have this slide, and I'm going to pull this up, of specific um, tool, specific tips or things that you're, you say that of ways to connect with the heart, and you alluded to some of these, but if you want to mm -hmm. go over them. Yeah, this was something I came up with uh, after uh, a couple of webinars and things that I'd done. Uh, before that, I came up with care this morning at 5.30 in the morning, but it really encompasses all the same things that were in the, in the care, just a little bit more specific on how to go about doing that. And I think, it, you know, this list, we'll have it available, but I think being um, intentional and in actually thinking through, coming up with a plan and executing it to connect with people based on the way they are, not just the way you are, but you got to take yourself into consideration too. Coach yourself and then consider who they are and then how you're going to do it. And uh, just thinking it through. And it's almost like I tell people when you're adapting your behaviors in an area that's not natural for you, you have to go beyond what feels probably natural. And coaching highly results oriented leaders, I tell them, you got to get out of your comfort zone. You got to feel this is on the edge for me. Uh, I remember I had a friend in high school who was a DJ and one time I went to the studio with him and he was behind that microphone and he was going, and today we have this. And I thought, well, that's stupid. But what I realized after I thought about it a little bit, if he had sat down and said, and today we have this, he would have been boring as all get out. He had to push it out. So later when I started doing radio in the early nineties with my boss, Larry Burkett, uh, I get behind that microphone and I realized I had to put some energy and some enthusiasm in the, what I, as I responded to questions and so on, else it was going to sound like I was a tired old man. So putting energy and enthusiasm and a smile in, even in your voice uh, can be very powerful. There's a proverb uh, that talks about uh, a good word and a smile uh, can really turn some, unleash somebody's heart who's depressed. That's in essence what it says. And it's so, it's just so true. Yeah, that's great. And this is a good segue to one of our poll questions, gentlemen. Um, and I'll go ahead and start this poll. And the question is, how natural is connecting with the heart for you, for you, the attendee or the participant today? Go ahead and place your votes and just to have an honesty check on the idea of connecting with the heart. Is it is that natural for you, Kevin? While we're doing this, what was the R, Lee? What was the R in in care that you said? Regard. Yeah, regard. Yeah. Yeah, I looked that word up, and it talks about uh, uh, being aware of somebody, becoming aware of somebody 
in a way that they know it, and usually with the steam, with some sort of esteem or caring that uh, they're held in like high regard. They're held in regard in a positive way. Yeah. Yeah, it's very specific when you say that you hold someone in high regard. I yeah. think. And right. I think, you know, by your body language and your approach and the way you say things, a person can tell to what degree you regard them as being valuable and important. I think that's the point. Yep. Gentlemen, here are our results from our audience. Um, so we have a, we have a very savvy, uh, uh, aware audience that, that is good at connecting with the heart. So most of our responses are naturally good. I'm okay, but need to do better. So that's, that's encouraging. Yeah. Well, we have a, uh, we, I think we tend to have a pretty uh, savvy audience and tribe that follows us, Hugh. You know, people that uh, are interested in this sort of thing, uh, also kind of attracted to it and uh, read about it in different ways. And so I like to feel sometimes we're preaching to the choir for most of the time. Yeah, I think preaching to the choir, but, but at the same time doing it all the time and being conscious of doing it is another matter. And can we all do it better and more mm -hmm. often? That's the, you know, that's the key thing. So at least I think we've got, you know, more and more people are, and I've seen this out there in lots of different communities, more and more people are wanting to do this mm -hmm. and feel it's okay to talk about meaning, purpose, values, whereas 15, 20 years ago, that was not a conversation really. Mm -hmm. Whereas now today that is a starting point and it's okay to, you know, open up your presentation or you're meeting with somebody, talk about uh, these types of things and just get deep in there from the, from minute one. It's okay. Whereas maybe in the past it wasn't. I think that's the shift that's happened. But can we all do it better and, and, and actually do it with um, authenticity is, is, is another matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, going back to the word, the term people culture, it sounds kind of soft, but the reality is every human being wants to feel valued and important. And when they are, they perform better. So if you're highly results oriented, you want to get better results, let your people know they're valued and you'll get better results because if you're genuine and sincere about it. And, uh, you know, um, I think about when I think about this sort of thing, I, quite often a little book I read uh, 10 or 15 years ago by Ken Blanchard and uh, I've forgotten the other guy's name, but Munchen or something, but it's called the leadership pill. And there were two people, two leaders, one took leadership pills every day. Okay. And basically made all his people take a leadership pill, which means he was totally results oriented and everything he did and everything he wanted them to do was totally results oriented. Well, that works for a while in a crisis, but pretty soon their performance starts to fade, whereas the person who's more balanced between people and mission results relationship, their performance gets better and better. So pretty soon those, those performance curves sloped, one sloped down and one sloped up. And in the long run, the people who are more balanced were going to achieve more. And that was the point of the book. So taking leadership pills will work for a little while in certain situations, but not over the long haul. Yeah, and that's a good segue to the next question, gentlemen, related to uh, the application, as you alluded to, uh, Hugh, uh, specifically with this idea of the platinum rule, which you mentioned in your book. So what is the platinum rule and how can it be applied uh, based on the unique makeup of each individual? Well, uh, we have a slide for that. It might well, you know, Hugh, I want to just say one thing before <clears throat> this is almost uh, the platinum rule is so close to the golden rule that people get it flipped around in their head. They, they struggle with it all the time, but it's doing to others as they would like to be done unto, which is to me, it's like, it doesn't replace the golden rule. It's taking it one step more granular to really relate to that person in a way that's going to help them the most. So I'll let you comment on that, Hugh. Well, I think what, what, you know, our natural thinking often would be is just to deal with people the way we want to be dealt with, but really it's about how they want to be dealt with. And it's, it, it's getting into their shoes, uh, seeing their lens, their perspective, you know, understanding who they are and uh, addressing them from that perspective. 
you know, for me, again, being a results orientated person, if I'm working with someone who's more relational, I've got to connect to their feelings and, 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 and create a calmer, more relaxed environment to have a conversation with them. Otherwise it's never going, otherwise it's never going to work. If, 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 if all I do is converse with them or relate to them, have a conversation, discuss an issue in my more fast paced environment, which I'm okay with, that, that, that won't work. Um, you know, it's like I've worked with a lot of financial advisors that are very extroverted, very low on detail. They're quite spontaneous, um, instinctive, nevertheless, very highly trained and, and skilled. But when they get a client in front of them, it's more like an engineer, uh, they get lost. And because that engineer is wanting details, they don't want to talk as much, they just want the information. And so that extroverted person's got to, uh, and, and, and that you know, spontaneous person's got to streamline the meeting to being very structured, detailed, uh, walking through all the steps. And, that, and that's really what we're, what we're talking about here is, and that's got to be done with everyone. And when you, when you see in your team, blockages come up and things not happening, or a conversation in the meeting, has got draining. Like I first found out, uh, you know, working with the CFO in my business when he first came to the business uh, many years ago, where we were both opposites. And I just had handled that conversation from my lens and my world, not understanding his. We both went home very tired that night. And if we hadn't have understood gone back to the tools that we use at DNA Behaviour and understood how which wants to be communicated with, we wouldn't have lasted very long working together, probably only a few months. So, I, you know, this is very important. It's not just paying lip service. You know, it's very important that you understand how another person wants to be related to and that you actually do it and you build a formula for working with each person that, in that way. And, that, and, that, and that's not just you know, the, the, our tools tell you what to do, but it's also having a conversation with the person about it and agreeing some ground rules is very important. Yeah, you know, that came up this morning. Uh, my wife and I were having coffee sitting at the breakfast table. <clears throat> I'd been up since five o'clock. She came up a little while later. I'd already had my two cups of coffee and um, she was just getting hers. Well, she's an introvert and I'm an extrovert. So when my foot hits the ground, the floor in the morning, I can talk about anything and everything at a thousand miles an hour. But we have this thing that happened a few years ago. She said, you know, I'd appreciate it if you don't talk much to me until I've had my second cup of coffee. So the platinum rule is Lee has to shut up until she's. Yeah. And, and so and so I started talking to her, telling her about the C-A-R-E. And by the way, the R stood for regard. Somebody asked that question. Uh, Kathy did. Um, and so I had to think and tell myself, I said, oh, I'm sorry, Mary, you haven't had your coffee yet. She said, it's okay, I'm, I'm sitting down this morning, I can listen, because you've got something to say and I, I'll listen. So she adapted to me a little bit, but I was willing to adapt to her. A lot, so many of the things we're talking about, Hugh, can be practiced at home, where we have these relationships, because so much of this is about getting along with people who are different. The platinum rule can be applied with your kids, your cousins, your brothers, your mother and father, your spouse, your girlfriend or whatever, boyfriend, whatever. So practice it there and you'll see the power of it for getting in, along and working with people. Yeah, I, I just feel, Lee, every day so lucky that, that I got on this human behavior journey back there in, in, in Sydney, Australia, and soon after I came and met you in Atlanta and, you know, I was completely hooked on it. And, you know, six or seven years later, I, I was fortunate enough to get married uh, here in America and have kids. So I, you know, started that journey late in life. But without knowing this, I don't know how I would survive, uh, you know, marital life and, 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 and create a good marriage and, and uh, you know, have happy children, you know, that I can engage with. Because, mm -hmm. you know, my two children are very different to me um, in, in many ways. And, this, this absolutely helps. And, and yes, you're right. Getting it right at home is a great place to start getting it right elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, we have a question. Should I go ahead and answer it? Uh, I see it on the chat menu there, Kevin. Should I go ahead and answer it now? Yeah, I think Melissa had a good question regarding uh, more of a result-oriented approach. Uh, she said, in this temporary work from home environment, what's the best approach to a monitoring performance of an employee who was having some issues before we were pushed for a work from home environment. 
you know, I'm coaching uh, three or four people right now. And one of them had this particular issue last week, a week before last, and we talked about it. And I think it's so important to uh, keep that balance of being concerned about them and knowing that they're in a difficult situation too. And at the same time, keeping uh, progress going. So we came up with some questions that he could use with this person to, you know, one, find out how they're doing. Uh, and then two, uh, what's, uh, what's something that you're working on right now that you feel good about, you're making progress? And then what's something where you're feeling not so good about where maybe you're not making progress? Let's talk about that. And if there's a specific program that you're concerned about, just that's a good chance to raise the issue. Well, how's that going? Tell me about how's that going? And maybe uh, I think, you know, in my Engage with Honor Courageous Accountability book, I have a chapter on collaboration. And part of that collaboration is to have milestones. You're collaborating with the person who's working for you in that you're helping them move forward. Now, some people need more collaboration, more, they're gonna take up more of your time to manage them, to help them move forward because uh, maybe they're a little bit over their head or whatever. Maybe they don't have a good work ethic and maybe you can help them develop that. But if you have milestones and every week you're talking about how they've done on the milestone, they know there's gonna be uh, a discussion on it and that can push them ahead. But it also prepares you in that if they don't come through, then it's been talked about on a regular basis and you've uh, kind of asked them, well, what's happening here? Why is why are the milestones not being met? And in a very concerned and caring way, and you can just keep applying the, the pressure down on them to either perform or it's gonna be obvious that things are not working out and you're gonna to have to hold them accountable. And that's where the confrontation comes and uh, that's when you need to be talking to HR or making any decisions in your own head. This is not working out. Does this person just not have a good work ethic or do I have them in the wrong place doing the wrong thing? You know, you, you might be disappointed in me if I worked for you and my job was to uh, do details all day long <laughs> and a long project that took several months. You, you would, uh, you would, be concerned about Lee getting distracted and not uh, making his milestones every week. It would be very hard for me because it's just not my natural thing. But yeah, I think things. Yeah, go ahead, Hugh. Yeah, I was going to say, Lee, playing to your point there, that that that's really important. That um, Melissa, you as the leader, know the talents of this particular employee. Uh, you know, not only this employee but everybody uh, on the team, but know their talents and then ask some questions, as Lee was alluding to that are more strengths-based questions to those talents to elicit out of them, you know, how they're going, how they're, uh, how they're feeling right now. I think you'll find where the blockage is uh, in, in, by doing that. And then really after that, it just comes down to fundamental respect uh, between each other for the business and for you as the leader to continually communicate with that person. And you'll know that when you know their style. Yeah, and just having you involved with them in that way, uh, if they see that you're willing, you're, that you can be a cheerleader for them or you can support them in some way if there's some something they need that they don't have and you can uncover that, you may be able to see that they've got a blockage that really, it's, it's minor, but to them it's major. To you looking at that blockage, it's that's easy and help them get through that and then they may take off and run with it. So. I think find, uh, Hugh, Hugh hit the nail on the head. Find out what is the area of blockage, what's keeping them from being successful. And the major, I've had people just say, you know what, this is just not for me. I don't belong here. Okay, if you've decided that, that's probably a good conclusion. And so I help them find some other place. Yeah, I think that's important. Some of, my, some of the people I know that are most successful, the people that found out what didn't work. You know? yeah. Sometimes as a leader, your job is to help them find out what's not working and find a place where they can work. I hired a lady in the organization I was in once. They were going to fire her because she was missing work a lot. And I knew she was mismatched. I had a gut feeling she was in the wrong place. And I said, why don't you let me try her first? She turned out to be a great employee for me because I had a job that really matched her talents and uh, wasn't multitasking, which is where they had her. And she was just getting stressed out. 
Kevin, yeah. it might be a good point just to bring go back to the pyramid graph. I can see a question was there. I don't know whether we went back to that pyramid graph when Kathy asked it. Right. Whether she has any any there's any more questions on that. Yes, I think they just wanted to see this uh, particular model again and how results and relationships fit within, the, within this entire model. We actually have one that's more colored in with different colors for the bottom and the two top ones. But <clears throat> when we're focused really on natural talents like we are today, we generally color in those two as green and blue. We use those colors kind of consistently a lot in our I think in our book, we haven't mentioned the Leadership Behavior DNA book that we launched in January. We are, we're not talking enough about our product, I guess, but it's filled with uh, the first four chapters are leadership and kind of getting into the idea of talents and struggles, strengths and struggles. And then we go into actually those eight uh, factors of behavior, 16 traits that go with them and really go down deeper into which ones are results focus and which ones are relationship focus and so on. So getting that in your head as a leader, it can be the simplest thing. And uh, it, it's one of the most powerful things you could ever have in your head as a leader. And it's funny because when I came in the military as a kid, many, many long eons ago, the one thing we learned in ROTC was this thing about character, mission, and people. And gosh, I had no idea how big a deal that was, but they, they purely understood that you got to take, you got to get the mission done, but you have to take care of the people. And the great leaders have always uh, been able to do that. I think if you read about them, you'll see that. Hmm. We did not have emotional intelligence for, uh, at the start. That was in the early 2000s when we started reading and seeing how powerful emotional intelligence is. And uh, that's the self-awareness about your own emotions, being able to manage your emotions appropriately, others' awareness, what are their emotions, and being able to respond appropriately. So when you're in these uh, online conversations with your team, you being aware of their emotions, where they are as much as you can be, and responding uh, to them appropriately can be very, very helpful, or you can undermine yourself also very quickly. And the top level there is the, <clears throat> the leadership competencies, which we all get by reading books and going to workshops and uh, as well as our education and training. Yeah, I think Lee, it's a, you know, you just, you just said something that's very uh, interesting. And I think with emotional intelligence, it's so important. And, and a lot of the time when we're in a, in a, in a conversation with a person or a team and we're in the room with everybody together, if, you, if you're somewhat alert, you can feel the emotions uh, when you're in the room with people. You can feel the energy in the room, as people say. But once, you're, once you go to this online environment, it's not quite as easy to do that. And it's not meaning you can't. You've definitely got to be an emotionally intelligent leader. In a way, you've got to be more emotionally intelligent, but it's harder to sometimes pick up the cues when, when, when you're in, in, in the remote environment because you can't feel the person quite as much. And, and, and what's going on, things can get hidden. And this is where it's even more important to understand where people sit on the blue and the, and, and the green there in the graph, you know, in terms of their style and, and how they will be operating. Uh, you know, because as we, as we know with uh, the, the DNA behavior systems, it's highly predictive in behavior. You will know who's been triggered, who's not been triggered, who's withdrawn, uh, how, you know, how they should be feeling. And that's where, again, I just sort of emphasize the, the highly emotionally. I think Hugh just had what I had this morning at uh, 1035 was power failure. We had complete power failure in our neighborhood. So uh, <coughs> this, um, Hugh's talking about the emotional intelligence. I just want to say how important I think it is for you as a leader or even a participant on a Zoom call or conference call or whatever, to take a positive approach, a positive attitude, assume goodwill until you see otherwise. Because right now, everybody is looking for something positive and needs that injection of enthusiasm and esteem and uh, positivity to battle with this isolation that's coming and the boredom and the fear 
that what's going to happen to my job, what's go, the world's going to be different. And I thought it might be good to kind of close out today uh, thinking a little bit about um, the adaptation for the future. What's the future going to be like? And as I was thinking about this morning, I was thinking about how uh, some things that you as a leader could be asking your people to uh, engage in problem solving, uh, make it a group effort. You might want to divide them up into smaller groups or groups of two or three, or you might want the whole team working on this project together. But some of the things would be, uh, uh, how is this change, how is this experience that we've gone through, and now as we are approaching, the, uh, thinking about going back into a full-scale mode, what changes will have taken place maybe that will impact our mission, our methods, our strategies, our tactics going forward, discussing those and getting creative ideas and brainstorming about what are they going to be, what's going to be different, what do we think is going to be different, and how can we prepare for that now? Uh, how can we best adapt? What, where are our customers? What's the product and, and the delivery system? You know, right now there's so many things changing so rapidly. And we don't know how long it's going to take things to wind back up and get back into full speed. You got a lot of talent. I can't tell you how talented your people are. Well, how do I know that? Because I know I've been put in a POW cell with 10 guys, with five guys, with two guys, with 50 guys. I was in a cell that was 1,800 square feet open space for almost two years with 52 guys. There was so much talent in that room, we could have done anything. We had people with a degree in astronautics from MIT. We had guys who minored in music at Stanford. We had so much talent in that room. You have a lot of talent on your team. And if you get them thinking about solving problems, being innovative and creative, you'll be amazed at what will come out of it. So, so often that we think that we have all the right ideas because we're, we're promoted, we're on top. We're the founder of the organization. When in fact, so many of the best ideas are latent down there in the lower levels waiting to be tapped into. And I want to encourage you to uh, just have those good brainstorming, give them assignment, let them think about it, come back and present their ideas. So now's the time to be vetting ideas and thinking about how can we thrive when the, it's time to put, on, put the gas on the pedal and go back to work full scale. And this is going to help people stay focused, engaged. They're thinking ahead. We were always in the POW camps. We were always thinking about the future and how could we prepare ourselves to go home and live a good life. Now, in the early years when the torture was bad and all, that was a more secondary. That was cropped up every now and then, but not as a normal thing. But eventually, because the American people put so much pressure on the communists, they changed our treatment and the torture stopped and we went kind of to live and let live the last couple of years. And that's when we had time to really get organized and start preparing ourselves, taking classes in that cell, learning to speak foreign languages, learning about calculus and all sorts of things that we didn't know before that prepared us. But we also personally prepared, getting our language cleaned up, getting our bodies in better physical condition and getting ready to go home. But what we found out was there was so much talent in there in that cell that we could uh, we could do almost anything. We had a guy who put together a drama and musical group and they performed South Pacific. Now I tried out for that, but uh, Bill Butler who was leading that effort, he said, Lee, you have a lot of talents, but I don't think this is the right one for you, boy. <laughs> and he was all right, I, got, I have a hard time keeping the beat. I like to dance, but I have a hard time keeping the beat. And so, but there were great talent in that room. We had bass and tenor, we had guys that could sing. It was uh, just amazing. So know that you got a lot of talent there. Your job is to uh, pull it out and put it, get it to work and people will feel freed when you use their talents and you start to say, wow, that's a great talent you have. It's amazing what that can do for people. Uh, I want to check and see if there's another question or two before we close out. It looks like Hugh has had the total power failure that uh, that we had here in our neighborhood. It must be a going thing today. Uh, Lee, we did have one question. I think it may be good to recap your CARE acronym one more time mm -hmm. uh, and, and, what, yeah. and what they are specifically. Right. CARE is to connect. Um, you know, I've made a big deal and I have a 
chapter in the book, uh, Engage with Honor book, called Connect. It's about connect with the heart. Now, the chapter before that's about connect based on personality, your natural talents, but then connect with the heart and being intentional to connect with that person to let them know they're valued and important is so powerful. And related to that, these others are affirm. How can you affirm this person? What have they done that you can affirm? And <clears throat> or just affirm them as a person that you're glad they're on your team because they have good character and they're a hard worker and dependable. And then in that process, you're showing regard. So we got uh, connect, affirm, and regard. I hold you in high regard. That's the message. You don't need to say that, but that's the overall uh energy that should be coming at that person that you're important and i hold you in high regard and finally to encourage encourage them in what they're doing encourage them uh as to where they are in their life encourage them in areas of personal stuff that may be going on that you know about so connect affirm regard which is holding them in high esteem and then uh, encourage so care i think if we do that <clears throat> you can't go wrong yeah, it's yeah. it's one of the most powerful things you can do because a person feels valued, important, and meaning, and every person wants that. I think you've done a great job, Lee, on talking about these principles. Is there any final thing before we go? And I want to mention our two offers before we go as well. Is there any final thing you want to mention as it relates to our current environment specifically? Um, is there you know, any nuance to what you've said regarding our current work environment? Well, the, um, uh, the offer that we had was the, uh, the work talents report, I think. We wanted people to be sure and consider that. If you take the work talents report, which we're offering, then um, that shows you some of, some of your key strengths. It shows you some connection, ways you like to connect. But it also, uh, that first circle there is your results relationship balance. So it would give you a real clear insight to that. And what I would recommend you take that you get this one page report, it's free, <clears throat> but then you might want to consider upgrading that to the full leadership behavior DNA report, which is 19 pages. So think about that and consider it, but there's just so much information on that one page. Uh, hope you'll think about that. And then the book leadership behavior DNA, it came out in January. Um, we've had a lot of great feedback on that because it's very specific. It's almost a how-to book on how to do what we've been talking about here today. Uh, we've had uh, wonderful feedback. We have some great endorsements from wonderful people in there. It's a very how-to book, but you and I kind of tell our story and we tell a lot of stories. Every chapter is filled with stories about our clients and our experience with them. And uh, I think you'll, you'll see played out in those stories not only the lessons of the leadership behavior DNA, but you'll see played out the lessons that you probably have experienced or going to experience in your own work and your own life. So take a look at it. Uh, you can access the book on at our website there. You can buy it in Amazon online or wherever you normally would buy your book. So that works fine. Here's the link there, leadershipbehaviordna.com talents for the talent report. Check it out. Uh, very powerful tool. A lot of information on one page. And I want to just say thank you to all of you. I see it, uh, Mickey's big hand is on the 12th, so our time is up. But thank you all for joining us today. We hope it's been helpful. And uh, check us out, check out our websites, DNA Behavior and Leadership Behavior DNA or Leading with Honor. Uh, we, but Hugh and I both do blogs. We do uh, video coaching type uh, short videos are all free. Go to our website, check it out and uh, let us know what you think. Thank you everyone for your time today. You will receive a recording of this webinar automatically in your inbox after we depart today. Thank you again for your time. Have a great rest of your day.